Uh, we're going to be, uh, for reference, we're going to be here in just a moment in Romans chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Uh, there's going to be an interesting way that Paul introduces this idea of our relationship to the law, which may not be a question you've thought a whole lot about. Like you might not have thought, what exactly is a Christian's relation to the Old Testament law? Do, are we still under it in any way? Or what uh, good might it do us? Maybe you've never put a lot of thought into that, but we're going to put a little bit of thought into that. Paul obviously did, and that's what he's going to be answering. Uh, this whole section, this quarter that we've been in, uh, is God's law is love, which I, I love that phrase. God's law is love is such a beautiful phrase, uh, and I think that's a, it's a, thing, it's a ni nice thing to study. But as I was thinking about his argument here, I was thinking about, uh, have you ever heard of someone that was tried after their death? Have you ever heard of any of these? Um, I actually looked up an article on this. There have been way more than you might think. Uh, and some of them are quite humorous, actually. And so uh, in the 9th century, Pope Stephen VI ordered that the corpse of his predecessor, Formosus, who had died eight months earlier, be removed from its tomb and brought to the papal court for judgment. With the corpse propped up on a throne, a deacon of the church, who himself was only a teenager was appointed to speak for the dead man, and Formosus was accused of various ecclesi ecclesiastical offenses, of which he was finally, shocker, found guilty after being harangued for hours by Stephen. So what happened was the corpse was stripped of its papal vestments in which it had been buried, and three fingers of its right hand had been used for blessing. Those were cut off, and finally the body was buried again, this time in a graveyard for foreigners, and it didn't stay there for long. It was uh, dug up, and it was thrown into the river Tiber, and even then, it wasn't over. A monk recovered his body and buried it for a third time, uh, luckily this time for good. Uh, you have uh, John Wycliffe. He's the philosopher and the, the theologian. He died on New Year's Eve in 1384. Uh, this fact mattered very little to the Council of Constance, which declared him a heretic in 1415. That's right. He died in 1384. But 30 years after his death, it was decreed that his books be burned and his body exhumed. That didn't happen until 1428, following an order from Pope Martin V. And then his bones were exhumed. They were burned, and then the ashes were thrown into the River Swift. Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury in the 12th century, was ordered to be killed by Henry II. But it was, it was another Henry, Henry VIII, who ordered Becket to be put on trial for treason over 360 years after he died. Uh, very interesting there. James VI of Scotland, the future king of England, ordered that the bodies of two would-be assassins, these brothers who had been killed in the act, should be preserved in whiskey and vinegar and allspice until they could be put on trial for their crimes. He apparently wanted their uh, lands confiscated, and so you had to go through a trial to do that. So that's why he wanted to preserve the bodies in order to go through that trial. Uh, they were disemboweled and preserved. Um, and then uh, they were sent to Edinburgh to be produced at the Bar of Parliament, and then eventually they were, had their estates uh, given away. In the 17th century, uh, one of the kings of France issued a general ordinance which made suicide, dueling, and treason capital offenses, even if the accused were already dead. The law stated that if it were possible, the corpse be brought into the court to face the accusations. Being unable to speak for themselves, a representative was to speak for them. The job was often taken by a close relative, but if there was none available, a state attorney would be appointed to do it, effectively entitling the dead to legal aid. And there would be a criminal trial uh, brought forth. As with a conventional trial, witnesses could be questioned and re-examined and testimonies given. And if a guilty verdict was brought in, the corpse would be dragged to the gallows and strung up by its feet. Once a satisfactory time had been passed or the state of the body became too tiresome for the neighbors, it would be cut down and disposed of. Much as was the case with the, uh, these uh, assassin brothers, the dead person's estate would be seized by the estate. Uh, and then you have these slow trials that also happen throughout time. It goes on to some details about some trials that basically took so long the person accused had died. But they went on with the trial anyway. So Paul is going to basically make the case that once you, once you die, then you know, you're no longer bound by, by law, basically. That's what he's going to make. So let's look at that. 
We're in Romans chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. Normally what my class we do is we just go read through the, read the whole entire thing and then we go back through verse by verse. That's what we're going to do. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 1. This is what it says. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example... By law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Well, certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law... Sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment was intended to bring life. It actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. All right. Little bit mealy mouth here. Little bit. Uh, difficult to understand, as is so much of Romans. So let's kind of walk through verse by verse. We'll figure some of this out together. Look at the text. Look at verse 1. He says, uh, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. So who is he talking to? Who, 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 who is his audience here? If he says, If he says in the text... For I'm speaking to those who know the law, you would assume that he's talking to Jewish people. He was, he's talking to Jewish people, or at very least he's talking to Gentiles that would be familiar with the law as well. Uh, but the idea is he's talking to a group of people who clearly are understanding what the law is. You know, Christians who are of Jewish background, most likely. Uh, we talked in our class last week about uh, the context of the entire book of Romans. So Paul had never been to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome. He knew a lot of Christians in Rome. Uh, and he's, he's kind of, he's writing because really he's basically saying, I, I want to be where you are, but in the meantime, I'm sending this treatise on ahead of me. And so he's probably talking to a lot of, uh, of, of Jewish Christians there. He's aware, though, that there would be Gentile Christians that are in the audience as well. I mean, he's, he's talking to a big group of people. Uh, but again, he's the idea, they're, they're familiar. And he begins with this basic idea, this legal principle uh, that is not confined to the law of Moses, which is laws don't apply to dead people. You know, that, that's just kind of how it goes. A corpse cannot be charged or convicted of theft, uh, even if you did that thieving before you died. And so in that sense, death kind of nullifies the authority of a, of a law that, that might have over, over somebody. So that's kind of the, the line of thinking. That's kind of where he's going with this. And then he's going to bring in this example of, of marriage. Now, before you go chasing rabbits on that, though, is he teaching on marriage? No, he's not teaching on marriage. Does he teach on marriage? Yes, he does quite a bit, particularly in Corinthians. He teaches on marriage, other places, Ephesians. But he's not doing that here. He's Again, he's just using marriage as an example to illustrate this idea of what do we do with the law? It's like, well, okay, when, you, when a person is, dies, they don't have the authority, the law doesn't have authority over them anymore. And he says, for example, so verse 2. A law, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law. So uh, Paul's point is that when, uh, when a, a, a man and a woman are alive and they're married, there is this you know, covenant between them, this contract between them, that this authority that is kind of over, over the two of them. And 
by the way, this was recognized, you know, do you have to be Jewish to understand that? Of course not. That, you know, anyone can understand this idea of, you know, when you're, when you're in this thing, you know, do you have this, this promise that's made? But even, I mean, at your wedding, did you say, uh, till death do us part? Was that a part of your vows? Everybody, was that a part of your vows, till death do us part? What does that mean? What happens when you die? Whatever promises you're making, you know, that's freeing you from those promises. So that's the idea here. By law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. If he dies, she's released from that bound. So this, he's using that law as an example to make that point that the commitment would end. Look at verse 3. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So he's kind of introducing um, a hypothetical situation, and it's the idea of the bond of the woman's initial marriage would not be broken by death of the first husband, uh, had not been broken by the death of the first husband, therefore she would rightly be called an adulteress. She violates that, that, uh, the seventh commandment if he's still alive. But if her husband died, the situation is much different. She's legally allowed to marry another man. That's not adultery. Um, but don't miss his main point, And that is that death frees her from that marital obligation that she made in that initial marriage. And she's permitted to marry without breaking that law. The situation no longer applies after what's happened, after that death has happened. So that's what kind of, you got to go with him here. All right, look at verse 4. We're still plugging along here. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. All right, so now we figure out what is he driving at. He's talking about our relationship as Christ followers with the law. Again, a question that maybe you've asked yourself before, maybe you haven't, but that's the question he's trying to answer here. He says, so we died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So as believers who have died to sin, and therefore the law, since the law defines what sin is, we can, be- we can belong to another. This is, a, this is another union that we have with him who was raised from the dead, Jesus Christ. There is no unfaithfulness to our first husband. So in that case, who was our first husband? It is the law. There's no unfaithfulness there. Due to the fact that we're no longer under its control, the result is that we begin to live in ways that bear fruit for God. Uh, He actually says that. He says, look at the end of verse 4. He says, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So what what is that? What is bearing fruit for God anyway? We see that phrase a lot in Scripture. When you see that, where does your mind go? Okay, we have the fruit of the Spirit that talks, it's, uh, it's talked about other places in uh, Paul's teaching. Okay, you're, when you're thinking of fruit, you're still thinking of, you're thinking of laws still here? Uh, well, Bearing fruit is... They, they had restrictions on everything they could do, like what they ate, mm-hmm. you know, where they could go, how far they could walk on the Sabbath, you know, all of those things uh, would, would be limited for what they could do in, do, in living a holy life. Mm-hmm. Where does your mind go at bearing fruit? God's work in any form. God's work in any form. God's work in any form. Define God's work. Well, like uh, 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 bearing witness, right? Uh, okay, so witnessing to others, that is one of the, I think, ways that Jesus uses that phrase of bearing fruit is the idea of sharing uh, this good news that we have. Go ahead, Mick. So Mick is saying that 
basically the, this idea of bearing fruit for God is doing kingdom work, expanding the borders of the kingdom, pressing the kingdom out into, into other places. And anytime we see uh, the kingdom expanding, maybe we, we recognize there's fruit here. I like that idea. Others? Yeah, so the idea of um, not just, uh, not just the, the, the peace and joy and love, but also uh, maybe evolving in our own life to be able to uh, become more Christ-like, become more... Um, let me know, when Jesus talked about the, the vine and the branches, he's saying, remain in me, which to me is, is basically saying, stay really close to uh, Jesus. And when you hang around someone a lot, what starts to happen... You start to take on their characteristics, you know, you start to think like they think and maybe even use the same phrases they use. In fact, have you heard about how when couples are together for a really long time, they start to look like each other? Maybe you know couples like that, you know, uh, <laughs> some of you guys, some of you guys, that's a, a tremendous blessing. Some of you. But what does that mean? That means bearing fruit for God might mean, you know, staying really close to Jesus so I can start to become more like Christ, like that idea. Well, let's keep, let's keep reading because, uh, again, this idea is that, that Paul is saying we are, we, are being, we are being unhinged. We are being no longer under the authority of the law. And he's going to talk about the purpose of the law here in a minute. But he's saying we, we're, we're doing that and now we have this freedom. The result is we begin to live in ways that bear fruit for God, that we're heading in this direction where we can actually bear fruit. So, so you guys kind of have an, in your minds what that, what that might look like. Uh, hold on, I had something else here in my notes. Oh, uh, this is, well, we'll get into that in a second. I'll, I'll, let's keep reading. Look at, ver, where are we at? Verse 5. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, you guys use that phrase a lot in your everyday life, the realm of the flesh. No, uh, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about that. When we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. That's a very opposite experience of bearing fruit for God is bearing fruit for death, he says. So he says, when we were in the realm of the flesh, um, that word that's translated flesh is, you see that all over the New Testament. Um, in fact, my, uh, my notes here says that word is a, used 147 times in the New Testament. And 60% of the times you, uh, you see that word, you see Paul using that word. Um, and he uses that word a lot, but he doesn't always mean the exact same thing when he uses flesh. I have six different ways he uses it. Uh, there's this idea of, of creatures generally, so flesh just meaning like uh, you know, biological creatures. Our bodies specifically, sometimes he talks about being in the flesh. In fact, in this afterlife series that we've been in on Sunday morning, you know, he talks about idea of being in the flesh, basically meaning still alive in my body. Also, he talks about the human race generally, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, being in the flesh is all human beings. Uh, things that are morally neutral, Romans chapter 1. Things that are morally negative, Galatians 6. But also a rebellious human nature. And I think that's kind of what he means here. Uh, being in the flesh is this rebellious human nature that we have. This uh, reality where we have these sinful passions that are uh, sometimes very difficult to control. Um, it's the urge to... Uh, gratify, you know, the things that your body is telling you to do, even if those things um, aren't necessarily good for you or if they separate you uh, from uh, the things that uh, God would have you to do. Uh, somebody read for me, um, somebody read Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Who's got that? Galatians 5, 24. So that is the same word there, flesh. It's translated other places. It's this idea of sinful desires. Um, you know, our, our material existence is prone to sin, these, these desires that we have that are, are sinful. And it's this idea of, of sin's dominion over us can use our own impulses against us. 
uh, and that is this fruit of death, this idea of that's taking us towards death, um, and it kind of wreaks havoc on us. I think it wreaks havoc, havoc on our you know, relationships, it wreaks havoc, havoc on our marriages, on our families, on our communities, on our churches, deadly consequences for our churches. Um, but that's what he's saying. When we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for the death. He just introduced a thought that he's going to really expand on, though. He says, the sinful passions aroused by the law. What he is recognizing is the law has power to arouse those sinful desires that we have. And check out what he's going to say about it. Look at verse 6. Go ahead, Paul. Exactly, and that's where we're going to go. Where, where we're going with this? Um, well, actually, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how that works right now. Um, let's do a let's do a thought exercise. Okay, here's what I want you to do. You can think about anything you want to think about, but but do not think about a trumpet. Okay. <laughs> Don't think about a trumpet. Think about whatever you want, but don't think about that brass trumpet with those. Don't think about that, okay? Don't think about a trumpet, you know, the, the horn out the end. Don't think about that, okay? What do you immediately do? You immediately start thinking about it. Why? Because I specifically told you not to do it. And again, to Paul's example of when you tell a little kid not to touch something, you know, what do they immediately want to do? They want to touch it. That, that is what Paul is going to say is the argument about the law. The law has this ability to arouse these desires in us. He says in verse 6, But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Um, and so this new existence that we have allows us to be released from the law. This whole concept of, I died to this and I can be released from it. This, this concept that we, we are very familiar with. And the focus and the drive of our new life is a completely different concept. It's not, don't think of the trumpet. Now it is pushing us to think of, oh, I think of this other thing where it's, it's, our focus can be pressed the spiritual way. Um, it's this new way of the spirit. And so it's this idea of serving God isn't just a matter of keeping rules or obsessing over this old written code. Uh, Paul's going to talk about that in other places that there is a sense in which we think rules make, make it feels kind of spiritual. It feels kind of spiritual to say, don't do this. And how can I be close to God? Well, I'm going to make a list of rules, and I'm going to not do those things, and then I can feel close to God. The problem with that, though, is what do you then become obsessed with? You become obsessed with those rules. And he's saying we're being freed from those rules so that we can push into a different direction. Go ahead, Mick. And uh, I think of it, uh, he, he's, um, Mick is saying, for those of you who are uh, on the live stream, Mick is talking about how people would use the law as, um, as something they would, uh, like a club, you know, that they would sort of attack people with and, and it, would become, uh, it would become kind of a weapon. And now it's the idea of we're free to something that is, is, a, lo is a loving thing. Um, and one example that I had in my notes about that along those same lines is, imagine if your spouse said, here's a list of rules that I'd like you to do in order to love me. And it's like, okay, I just want you, I want you, to, follow, I want you to follow these rules. My question is this, could you follow those rules and not really feel romantic love towards your partner? Probably so. <laughs> is that what they're seeking with the, with the list of rules of love? Probably not. Uh, you know, it's this idea of, of why do these exist? And, 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 and then what happens if that's the way you live for a while? Here are the um, 62 rules to love me, okay? And you live by that for a while and you tried your best to keep them and maybe you even did successfully. 
and, but you felt like, man, this is like not how I want to do this. But what if then those rules went away, but then it's just, no, I just want you to love me. Now, you, now you're sort of this, you know, free to love. And that's sort of the argument, I think, that Paul is making here. And it's kind of what Mick, I think, is saying there. The idea of the direction is, is changed from something that is, uh, is used against to, to I'm going to draw you in this other direction. I'll, I'll just pause and say other thoughts there. Right, so Paul says, uh, for Christians, we have the Spirit as well to, to guide us. And so um, the Spirit is, is going to be a big part of that. Um, now, here's the argument you might make. So if, if it's true that, I, that when I tell you, don't think of a trumpet, that causes you to, it arouses in you immediate thoughts of a trumpet, is the rule, don't think of a trumpet, bad? I mean, that's kind of what he's saying is, well, well wait a second. If, if we're saying that the law is going to arouse these sinful desires, then maybe the law itself is, is bad. Um, and that's what he's going to say. Maybe the law itself is sinful. He's going to answer that. Look at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? And how does he answer it? What's your Bible say? Mine says certainly not. What's yours say? Anybody have anything different? God, heaven forbid. What else? May it never be. By no means. I mean, he, yeah, it, it's, it's, heck no. He, he, is, he is answering his own rhetorical question. He's saying, absolutely not. Nevertheless, well, now we, wait a second. He's just going back and forth. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Now, that's a curious thing to say. Do I need the law... What's that, the 10th commandment? Do I need the 10th commandment to know what coveting is? Do, do I need a law that says do not covet? What is coveting? It's a desire to have something possessed by another that, of which I have no right to. Coveting is, it could be sexual desires, greed, jealousy, um, whatever it is. Would I know what that is without the law? Go ahead. If you're led by the physical nature, that's where you go. I mean, that's the physical nature wants what it wants. Yeah. What are you saying, Mike? Which I, I think is, that's Paul's whole point. Because in a way, you could think of coveting as morally neutral. You could think of it as a neutral act. You know, well, so what that I want what you have. But, but because there's a law against it, now I am aware uh, that it is bad. Go ahead, Billy. You had something? <laughs> exactly. And in a way, um, uh, Paul is saying, or uh, Paul, um, Billy is saying that coveting exists uh, whether, you know, there's a law or not. There's, we, it's been there from the very beginning, uh, and he used Cain and Abel as an example. Um, and I think you're right. I think coveting is, is um, in fact, is a way, is a seed to a lot of other, of, of other sinful behavior. It is the beginning, you know, seed of a lot of things that go wrong in our lives. You think about the command about adultery. Where does that start? It starts with coveting your neighbor's wife. You know, it starts with wanting something that doesn't belong to you. Um, let's keep reading uh, verse 8. But since seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So he had uh, experienced covetousness, um, but he had been able to control it, knowing of the Tenth Commandment had made Paul aware of all sorts of wrong desires that he harbored in his heart. And then, you know, as you're aware of those things, it sort of creates in you uh, sin. It takes the opportunity, um, you know, to do more coveting, basically. Look at verse 9. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intending to bring life actually brought death. 
And I like this idea, he says, once I was alive apart from the law. Um, that is how most people in our culture feel. Boy, life is great. They, they don't have, you know, any sort of uh, absolute truth, moral authority in their lives other than themselves. And to them, this is exactly what they would say. I am, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling alive. Uh, it's the idea of I was alive apart from the law. You know, it's, it's like the behavior of a child um, <laughs> who... You know, they don't have any worries in the world. Uh, they're, you know, all are, ba- a two-year-old does not feel guilty for taking a toy from another two-year-old. Trust me, if you don't believe that, you've never had a two-year-old before. They feel like it's their moral obligation to have that toy from, you know, the other two-year-old. Um, it's like, I'm, yeah, I feel, and when I get the toy, what do I feel? I feel alive. Uh, you know, that's how I feel. That's kind of what he's saying here. Um, but you're, you're, com- you're this, this, this fact kind of hits you in the, in the faith. The, 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 the word that jumps off the page to me is death. It says, sin sprang to life and I died. And then it says, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. It's this vicious cycle where I'm, I'm told what covet, coveting is. And then sin takes the opportunity to really bring up all kinds of things in my mind. Places I can covet. And that... That kind of leads to death. I, I, when I was outside of that circle and I was unaware of it, I felt alive. But, but really, that was death, too. That's kind of, I think, what Paul is getting at here. Um, it's, this, it's this awareness cycle. Awareness of sin awakens a desire to sin. And that's sort of a cycle. Look at verse 11. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment put me to death. And so this is a very dangerous thing that's happening. Um, And again, our culture would say, listen, whatever, you know, two consenting adults want to do is their business. But, uh, you know, we want to be allowed to follow the desires as valued by, you know, our ourselves. But that is a fraudulent approach to life because um, it is fed by this self-centered sin and we think we find this rich life, but in the end, that pursuit is death. That's the idea. It deceived me, and it put me to death. Verse 12. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. <laughs> so he's going to expand on that verse 7 question, is law sinful? And he's going to basically say, the law of Moses isn't really sinful, nor you know, uh, sinless. It is not the cause of sin. The law is just the definition of sin. That's all it really is. And it's holy in that sense, that it defines sin. It is, um, it's righteous because it promotes justice. It's good because it was given by the Lord for, for, God, for the, God's people's benefit. And <clears throat> we can maybe, I think everything else beyond that discussion of the law is sort of up for, up for discussion about what exactly is its value. And, you know, you could go through all of the different, you know, as you talked about, the minutia of the, of the law, the, the ways it was interpreted. You could even go through the Ten Commandments themselves and kind of talk about <coughs> what are, you know, in what ways they benefit us and, and what it would, in what ways it would benefit our culture to uh, hold up the Ten Commandments, you know, uh, more. Uh, I know you guys remember that argument that, that happened, was in the 90s mostly, I think, when all kinds of Ten Commandments were being put in public places and there was all kinds of litigation about it. You know, we could argue about the, the benefit of having the Ten Commandments in front of, in front of everybody. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's still good. The, the Ten Commandments are still good. Um, but the Ten Commandments are also that first, in a, in a sense, it's that first marriage where it's no longer this law that's over us. There's a freedom there's a freedom that we have that we're going to want to naturally obey. Even if you took away those rules of loving me, now I, I want to love you in a different ways. Does that, that kind of make sense? Other thoughts? Yeah, I've said to my Bible class before that... Uh, if you look in Leviticus, it's basically God's rules for if I'm going to live with you, here's what you have to do so I don't kill you. Um, and, and yeah, that's kind of what it amounts to.
And that was literally the only rule. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and I wouldn't be aware of the law, or I wouldn't be aware of my coveting if the law didn't shine a light on it. And when the light is shined on it, does it sometimes stir me up to covet? Maybe, but that doesn't, make, that doesn't mean that it was bad. You want to shine the light on that. I want to know that. Well, someone has, the Spirit, ha, ha, you know, is the one that does that for us. But all right, well, I, I'm, I hopefully, um, I never, by the way, I never asked what lesson you guys were on. I just did which one we were on. So hopefully that was the lesson y'all were on. Uh, if you're in the same, uh, if you're in the same um, sequence and everything that we're at, we will be in Galatians chapter 2 next week. So Galatians chapter 2. No, that's the... That's the trombone. That's a good strategy, though. You think of a trombone, then you're not thinking of a trumpet.